President Obama for a minute. Uh, this is when he was speaking before the American Israel Public Affairs Committee's annual convention in March, touting his military and diplomatic support for the Israeli government. The fact is, my administration's commitment to Israel's security has been unprecedented. Our military and intelligence cooperation has never been closer. Our joint exercises and training have never been more robust. Despite a tough budget environment, our security assistance has increased every single year. And just as we've been there with our security assistance, we've been there through our diplomacy. When the Goldstone Report unfairly singled out Israel for criticism, we challenged it. When Israel was isolated in the aftermath of the flotilla incident, we supported them. When the Durban conference was commemorated, we boycotted it, and we will always reject the notion that Zionism is racism. When one-sided resolutions are brought up at the Human Rights Council, we oppose them. When Israeli diplomats feared for their lives in Cairo, we intervened to save them. When there are efforts to boycott or divest from Israel, we will stand against them. And whenever an effort is made to delegitimize the state of Israel, my administration has opposed them. So there should not be a shred of doubt by now. When the chips are down, I have Israel's back. President Obama addressing APAC. Your response? Well, I think the obvious response is that President Obama clearly doesn't believe a word he's saying. And that's probably the most troubling or the most disconcerting thing about listening to him. President Obama, he grew up or he got his political start in a liberal Jewish area of Chicago in Hyde Park. And his company, his crowd, uh, his constituency was basically, in significant part, liberal American Jews. And he knows what he's saying is false. Uh, he's probably the most uh, least—he's the least political president, in, um, at least in modern American history. He doesn't really believe a word he's saying. If you read, for example, the memoirs of Cheney and Rumsfeld, I did read through them. They're hefty volumes, but I went through them, curiosity. Like them or not, there is deep conviction there. You know, with Cheney, when he first meets uh, Bush, when Bush is going to nominate him for president, he says to Bush, and I believe it, I know a lot of memoirs is, uh, you know, not to be taken literally, but he says to Bush, I'm very conservative. I'm warning you. And Bush says, that's OK. You know, we can deal with that. Uh, Obama is nothing. One day, he makes death lists of people to kill. The next day, he gives Bob Dylan a medal. Then he talks about how he supports Israel blindly. And you could easily imagine, if there were money and votes in it, the next day, he would be supporting Palestinian rights. There is absolutely no conviction there. And I think there, Peter Beinart, in his book, his recent book, The Crisis of Zionism, he gets it exactly right. He says oh, Obama is actually a liberal Jew in his uh, mental outlook. And so he knows everything he's saying uh, is not true. He says he has, uh, we have Israel's back. Well, what he actually means is uh, rich American Jews have me, meaning Obama, in their pocket. And I have my hands in their pocket. He wants uh, liberal Jewish uh, contributions, and that's really and what it's about. And you're saying that liberal Jews in America are changing their views yeah, on uh, Israel you know, the, the, There's no question, if you look at two kinds of information, you can look at, for example, the poll data. And the poll data shows that there is a serious decline. Not yet, we, call, we can't call it a precipitous decline, but there is a significant decline in American Jewish support for Israel. And then there's the, what you might call the anecdotal data, the, what you might call the uh, high-profile defections. So there's a Peter Beinart, who's a former senior editor at the New Republic. Then there's David Remnick in The New Yorker. 
And both of them influential positions, and you know they have a one finger in the air checking which way the wind is blowing, and they have very sensitive antenna, and they realize the Jewish community is moving in a new direction, and we better, as it were, you know, get with the program. I know I'm missing, I'm mixing metaphors there, but get with the program. The Jewish community is changing. Uh, <clears throat> it used to be, even interestingly enough, even as early as about say, six or, six or seven years ago, the chief correspondent for The New Yorker on the Israel-Palestine conflict was Jeffrey Goldberg. And Jeffrey Goldberg now, he's become a kind of caricature even of himself as he tries to defend Israel blindly. And he's also no longer at The New Yorker, because the kind of coverage, the kind of apologetics, uh, the kind of just hackneyed propaganda simply won't fly any longer with American Jewish community. They don't want to hear it. They don't believe it, you know, because, at least in the case of Netanyahu, you could say there is, and Avigdor Lieberman, there's a certain amount of truth in advertising. And uh, it's very difficult to, from a liberal point of view, justify the way they carry on. Just to take one other example, you are in the, I speak a lot on college campuses. And liberal American Jews, especially young American Jews, they're very idealistic, as I'm sure you know from your own experience and your own family. They tend to be liberal and idealistic. So it's 2006, Israel invades Lebanon. It's the last uh, 72 hours. The war is over. It's over. Israel, the UN has passed a resolution, finally, Condoleezza Rice is blocking it. The war is now over. And then in the last 72 hours, Israel drops 4 million, 4 million cluster submunitions on South Lebanon. Uh, Human Rights Watch did a very good report. It's called uh, um, Flooding South Lebanon, Flooding South Lebanon. Now, you're young, you're Jewish, you're on a college campus. You don't want to defend that in public. Or it's 2008, 2009, Israel invades Gaza. And it drops white phosphorus, a substance that reaches 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It drops it in two hospitals, Al-Quds Hospital, Al-Wafa Hospital. You're young, you're Jewish, you're idealistic. You don't want to defend those sorts of things. It's just impossible for you, especially if you're a younger person, you haven't yet become too cynical about the ways of the world. It's impossible for you to reconcile your idealistic, liberal credo beliefs. And young people, as I hope you still remember, they tend to really believe what they say. There's a certain depth of passion and commitment, conviction, honest conviction. Um, they can't reconcile that with the way Israel carries on. It's not possible. And where do you see that point of view being expressed in this country? Do you see it in mm -hmm. the media? Do you see it in elite politics? Uh, it's expressed in several places. First of all, and most importantly, it's expressed on the, on the Internet. Uh, it's not yet to the point of the Washington Post or the New York Times, but it's definitely liberal bloggers. Liberal Jewish bloggers, you know, during the attack on Gaza and then during the assault on the Mavi Marmara, uh, the liberal Jewish bloggers um, were very tough on Israel. And frankly, there are few areas of disagreement between myself and them. Let me just take one other example, which I think is kind of illustrative. If you go back a generation, when Professor Chomsky was doing battle intellectually with the liberal Jewish community, so his main adversaries were people like Michael Walzer, Alan Dershowitz, Irving Howe, uh, and yeah, uh, Dershowitz, Howe, uh, Walzer, uh, those types of persons. The area of agreement, if you were to take a Venn diagram of the two, you couldn't even—they didn't even touch. There was no agreement on anything. Now, when I sat down and read Peter Beinart's book, and he's sort of representative of the same left liberal tradition, but no, I would say I agreed with about 80 percent. I was quite—I was very positively surprised by that. The amount, the area separating me from what you would call left liberal, I mean, they may not, 
they may not like to hear it, <laughs> but the amount of space separating me from them is, okay, it's still there. There is a significant 20 percent, but 80 percent, yeah, there's a large overlap. Uh, and that, I think, is not because I've gone soft, you know, I'm becoming, you know, moving towards the center. No, I'm not. Same principles as always. Uh, I think because the, the, the spectrum has shifted. It's shifted significantly. We're talking to author, scholar, activist Norman Finkelstein. Uh, he has just written the book out this week, Knowing Too Much, Why the American Jewish Romance with Israel is Coming to an End. When we come back, we'll talk about his other book, What Gandhi Says About Nonviolence, Resistance and Courage. What Norman Finkelstein found might surprise you. Stay with us.